to thank the uh, Federation and the members and guests this morning and the moderators. Um, new things are happening in anesthesia that have particular interest to us in bariatric surgery and particularly to more minimally invasive bariatric surgery. And I'm going to talk briefly about a study which confirms several others done in other areas of surgery, and that is that other techniques can improve the quality of the anesthesia offered to our patients. It's a cliche, and all of us realize, that the anesthetic and surgical management of bariatric surgical patients are difficult because of respiratory problems in the perioperative period. Other problems include post-operative nausea and vomiting. And a new area of research is using opioid sparing techniques, or that is to say, can we use other pathways in the brain, other drugs, to avoid the use of narcotics, thus decreasing respiratory depression and post-operative nausea and vomiting in our patients. Opioids, uh, narcotics have been a foundation in our therapy of pain for hundreds of years now. Um, but, as we all recognize, narcotics have their own side effects, particularly respiratory depression, sedation, urinary retention, and nausea and vomiting. Opioid sparing is an area of anesthesia and analgesia research which demonstrates that there are other pathways in the brain that can affect the sensation of pain. So the alpha-2 receptors, and particularly the NMDA, or the N-methyl-D-aspartate receptors, have been demonstrated to be anesthetic and analgesic pathways. If we can use these pathways, then potentially we can spare or decrease the use of narcotics but still protect our patients from pain and decrease post-operative nausea and vomiting. Drugs in which other studies have demonstrated successful opioid sparing include dexmatomidine, a rel relatively new drug you might not be familiar with, ketamine, an old drug, clonidine, NSAIDs such as ketorolac, melatonin, gabapentin, and dextromethorphan. Dexmatomidine, like clonidine, is an alpha-2 receptor agonist. It's sedative, analgesic, sympatholytic, anxiolytic, and causes sedation without respiratory depression. Ketamine, an old drug that's been used in the past, is an NMDA receptor antagonist and has also been shown in several studies now to be opioid sparing. Our study is in patients undergoing mini gastric bypass, a relatively short and simple procedure and it compared the use of total intravenous anesthesia with remifentanil and propofol to patients undergoing total intravenous anesthesia with the addition of opioid sparing doses of dexmatomidine and ketamine. We compared a variety of assessments, including post-anesthetic recovery analog pain scale, the number and need for narcotic doses, post-operative nausea and vomiting, and overall patient satisfaction, and anesthesia nurse satisfaction with recovery. Over a two-year period, there were 720 MGB patients. 343 had the TIVA plus ketamine and dexmatomidine, and 377 had the TIVA alone. The mean age, as in most studies of bariatric surgery, was average at the age of 39, 85% female, BMI of 45. And the MGB, a short, simple operation, had an operative time of 38 minutes. Postoperatively, no patient required reintubation for respiratory depression. And this is really the crux of the study, and we can summarize the entire study here by saying, basically, the addition of opioid sparing drugs improve the quality of the anesthesia. And let's look at that quantitatively. Fewer of the ketamine and dexmatomidine patients required any narcotics in the recovery room. When TIVA with short-acting drugs like propofol and remifentanil is stopped, the patient then is almost immediately without any anesthesia or analgesia. 
And so those patients commonly, 90%, require post-operative rescue narcotics. With the addition of the ketamine and dexmetomidine, which is not, does not induce nausea, does not induce respiratory depression, the need for narcotics dropped from almost 90% to almost 10%. There was also a concomitant increase in respiratory rate. Again, because there's less use of narcotics, the patients breathe more because narcotics are respiratory depressants. There's, because we use less narcotics, there's less post-operative nausea and vomiting. And overall, although the patient satisfaction was good to begin with, patient satisfaction improved. So in conclusion, there are new things happening in the area of anesthesia and analgesia for general surgery, and particularly important because of the respiratory component of these new techniques. Opioid sparing techniques are being evaluated in a variety of drugs. And what our study demonstrates, confirming many others in the literature, is by adding opioid sparing drugs to our present anesthetic techniques, we can give the patients equal amounts of pain relief, decrease respiratory compromise, decrease the attendant post-operative nausea and vomiting that often uh, goes along with the narcotics and their use, and improve overall the quality and safety of our anesthesia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there any? Any questions from the floor? Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, can I just ask you about muscle relaxants? I haven't mentioned muscle relaxants at all. Um, how does that play a role in your technique? Uh, I think that's a terrific question. I did leave that out. Um, but what we found, of course, is that muscle relaxants are routinely a part of many general surgical procedures and we find that in the majority of our cases we can avoid them with relatively deep use of the TIVA, the dexmetomidine and ketamine at the time of surgery. Basically it works out simplistically this way. Older, sicker, heavier patients in whom paralysis is more dangerous routinely do not need it with this type of anesthetic technique because they have a more relaxed abdominal musculature. Younger, healthier, healthier, and fitter patients sometimes require it. So what we do is we titrate the need for muscle relaxants based on the evaluation at the time of surgery. And basically less than 10% of our patients require any muscle relaxants at all using this technique thus improving the safety of the technique because there's no reversal and the attendant nausea and vomiting with reversal. So we found this technique is very useful in protecting our patients from the need for paralysis as well. So great question. And if you do need to use it, what do you, what do you use? Uh, there's a little argument amongst our anesthesiologists about the choices. Um, very short acting uh, and, and I apologize, I, I'm not sure which, cho which they choose. Another question? Well, I must congratulate you. I'm an anesthesiologist, so I can understand what you were doing. Uh, this is a very nice movement, and I appreciate that you also start this in the bariatric uh, anesthesia. <coughs> uh, there are two small things. There's one old factor regarding the opiate sparing that is local wound infiltration, and infiltration where the drocars have been set, and this seems to be very uh, effective in sparing uh, opioids. I don't know if you have had uh, any of the experience in, in that because it's also the surgeons who have to do that. And so we anesthetists have to force you to, to do this effect. Uh, second thing about the muscle relaxants, <coughs> I'm not totally agree with, with your command in that <coughs> it's TIVA doesn't do anything of muscle relaxation. It's only inhalation anesthetics who really do have an, an, a relaxation effect. And also agree that not everyone needs muscle relaxants, yes. but you can know that from the beginning of the laparoscopy if you measure the abdominal compliance. And then you will see that 20 to 30 percent of the patient really need muscle relaxants till the end of the procedure. <laughs> and there, Sugamadex, a new drug, is really also very effective in having patients really breathing very well uh, because that really stops the muscle relaxation so strongly and that's also a new uh, aspect that is entering the bariatric anesthesia and has a really 
that. Well, one of your greatest fears is if you're talking outside of your own specialty. So my greatest fear was that an anesthesiologist would be here this morning. <laughs> um, great, you have two important points. And let me see if I can touch on those again. The first point was... The infiltration of, of the... Yes, and let me comment. So what he's talking about is there's a variety of research where you actually infiltrate the port sites with Marcaine or uh, other drugs. We actually, in a separate study, compared that and what we found was no significant difference in pain relief. As you know, the literature on that is somewhat mixed. Really, really it's very, it's very, what we found is that the only difference we could find is when we asked the surgeon to inject the wound, the operative time increased by 10 minutes on average. But we did not see a decrease in the need for pain. Uh, one thing we do, which again I think is uh, not certain that it helps, is we in inject intraperitoneal marcaine, but again, you know, the research on that is very Absolutely. iffy. Yeah. But I think those, uh, that study suggests to me that the uh, advantage of adding that 10 minutes of OR time to inject 50 cc's or 25 cc's of marcaine has little benefit, if any, whereas the, the new use of uh, the opioid sparing drugs, tremendous difference. That if you were to talk to our recovery room nurses, they would say it's a completely night and day difference. Uh, the other issue is you're exactly right. What we use is with our Tiva is we use a BIS monitor and we find if we hit them hard and early with a high dose of the propofol or Remy, we can usually relax the musculature in the majority of our patients. But some of the younger, fitter uh, patients with more muscular tone, we do in, a, in selected cases add in some additional muscle relaxant. Yeah, but you never measured real the muscle relaxation in the abdomen. You don't have to. You look, you can't see. Mm. No, no. You <laughs> then you turn and fuss at no, the anesthesiologist. No, yeah, we have to measure it really. Yeah. Yeah. Just another question with, uh, with this issue. Um, did you notice that during the, um, during the, the operation, when, when using your Remy Fentanyl, you have a very important small bowel movement. Uh, the normal peristalsis of the bowel seems present and not changed by the TIVA, but it's, in this study and our other studies, we always use Remy. So every one of our patients get that, and uh, we feed our patients within an hour or two. So I don't think Ilias in the you know, 30 minutes of uh, Remy fentanyl um, is a real issue. We certainly see peristalsis during the surgery. Uh, Greg Lamson, uh, another anesthetist from Australia. Uh oh. Uh, <laughs> that's good to see other anesthetists are actually here. Um, just to reinforce, uh, yeah, I certainly found I do mainly laparoscopic gastric banding anesthesia, uh, or anesthesia for laparoscopic gastric banding, and uh, I've certainly found that clonidine makes a huge difference. Yes. I'll, I think I'll start using a bit of ketamine after your talk, see how that goes. And I've just recently started using Shugamidex to reverse rocuronium for the muscle relaxation and finding it very, very good. At the moment, it's a bit expensive. It's about $100 US for a reversal dose, which is, you know, reasonably expensive compared to neostigma. But uh, you certainly don't get the nausea problem that you get with neostigma. Right. The reversal is a lot quicker and, uh, and, and also more effective. And you can also reverse a, a stronger block with, with using Shugamidex and I'm certainly finding that very useful in some cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, next speaker.